In the year 395, the Roman Empire split into two parts, the Western Roman Empire, which included Rome, and the Eastern Roman Empire, sometimes called the Byzantine Empire after its capital at Byzantium and which became Constantinople during the reign of Emperor Constantine. The split of the most powerful empire in Western Europe happened for a number of reasons. One, it would be easier to administer a smaller area, considering the means of communication at the time. Two, the borders of the empire were threatened by many hostile people, and it was believed that dividing command and control would make defending the empire easier. Three, it was believed that having two equal emperors would lessen the number of power struggles that had been taking place within the Roman Empire for decades. One thing didn't change with the division of the empire, however, the use of torture and bizarre punishments to keep the people and rivals in line. Here at A Day in History, we love stories about the unusual, the dark, and the just plain twisted. You must too, that's why you're here. If you'd like to help us continue to create new and unusual videos, please like and subscribe to our growing channel. Hail Caesar! In the 1975 movie, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, Chicken Knight, Sir Robin's minstrels try to buck up the cowardly knight with a song. It goes something like this. He was not in the least bit scared to be mashed into a pulp, or to have his eyes gouged out and his elbows broken, to have his kneecaps split and his body burned away, and his limbs all hacked and mangled. Brave Sir Robin. Sir Robin remained a coward, however, and who wouldn't? No one looks forward to having his eyes gouged out, etc. Speaking of eyes being gouged out, this seems to be one of the more popular punishments and tortures in the Byzantine Empire. An account from 1437, 16 years before the empire's fall to the Ottoman Turks, tells us this. In front of the palace, the emperor ordered the criminal's hands to be cut off and his eyes put out. I inquired as to why they did not put him to death, and they replied that the emperor could not order his soul to be destroyed. Merciful emperor, indeed, for many hundreds of thousands of people were put to death during the lifetime of the Eastern Roman Empire. Another Byzantine favorite was rhinotomy, the removal of the nose. If you've seen the movie The Northman 2022, you know that you can live without a nose, but you couldn't be a Byzantine emperor for laws forbade the most powerful and exalted figure in the land from being a person who had been disfigured. Political enemies at the highest levels would sometimes cut off the nose of rivals if they had the opportunity to prevent them from taking the throne. Emperors overthrown and not killed outright often had their noses cut off. Even with a leather or cloth mask to prevent foreign bodies from entering the space where the nose used to be, everyone knew what lay underneath. Of course, laws are only as strong as the paper or parchment they're written on, and there were exceptions. The Emperor Justinian II was involved in a power struggle with two rivals, one of which who had just replaced Justinian on the throne after having cut Justinian's nose off. Undaunted, Justinian covered his nose with a shield made from pure gold and, being powerful, retook the throne. Shortly thereafter, his two rivals, former emperors Leontios and Tiberius III, had their noses cut off before being killed. Justice belonged to Justinian in 705 AD. By the way, Justinian's nickname was Rhinomitos, or Slit-Nosed. It seems that among the ruling classes, golden noses were a trend in the Eastern Roman Empire. The Byzantine general Titikios, who led the armies of the empire on the First Crusade, also had a golden nose. One of the most famous blinding incidents in Eastern Roman history was ordered by the first woman to rule the empire. Irene of Athens had acted as regent, a sort of ruling caretaker, for her son Constantine VI, 780 to 797, until he was old enough to rule on his own. As you can see by the dates, Constantine only lived for 17 years, and his reign was very short. The emperor and his mother argued over an important religious question that later became an issue in Renaissance Italy and during the first part of the Protestant Reformation as well. In the Byzantine Empire, this argument was over whether icons, generally stylized portraits of holy figures such as Jesus, Mary, various saints, etc., had a place in the church. The church for the Eastern Roman Empire was not Catholicism, but what is now known as Eastern Orthodoxy. To this day, in Greece, Russian, Ukraine, Serbia, and in Orthodox churches around the world, 
Icons are revered not only as symbols, but literal windows into the holy. During Irene's lifetime, an argument was raging over whether holy figures could or should be accurately depicted by human hands. Iconoclasts opposed icons and believed holy figures could not be fully comprehended by human beings, much less painted. However, many, if not most others in the empire at the time, believed strongly that icons themselves were holy, and riots occurred around the debate. Constantine was an iconoclast. He wanted all icons in his territory removed or destroyed. His mother was opposed to this strongly, so strongly that she had her own son blinded. It was done so violently that Constantine VI died of his wounds, and Irene took power herself. The most kind way of blinding someone in the Byzantine Empire was to place red-hot cups over their eyeballs. This would quickly destroy the surface of the eye and blind the victim. Of course, this was painful, probably excruciatingly so, but not as painful as having one's eyes gouged out with a tent peg, a candelabra, or a dull kitchen knife, all methods recorded by history. Another popular punishment in the Byzantine Empire was castration. Castration is not the removal of the penis, but the removal of a man's testicles. Not only is the punishment obviously carried out with no pain-killing drug or even alcohol extremely painful, but it was also many times fatal, as infection would often set in after the procedure. Afterward, men were sewn up or cauterized to close the wound. Cauterization is burning an open wound, essentially melting the edges of the wound together, hopefully stopping the bleeding in the process. Unfortunately, the same method used to heal the injury was often as painful as the wound itself, perhaps even more so. You have to believe many men passed out during or shortly after castration. The pain of cauterization would almost surely wake them up. A man who has been castrated is known as a eunuch, or sometimes in European history, a castrati. Before we tell you a bit more about how castration was used in the ruling class of the Byzantine Empire, we should say that it was, at times, not a punishment, but voluntary. There were many cases in medieval Europe of monks castrating themselves or having themselves castrated to remove temptations. This often worked as much of the testosterone produced in the male body is made in that location. But not all testosterone is produced in the testes, which means that many men who were castrated occasionally found themselves sexually aroused. Moreover, castration does not imply a man cannot get an erection. His drive is usually lowered, but not always. Castration renders a man unable to have children, which is why rulers used it in the empire. By ordering castration of rivals, a powerful man, usually but not always the emperor, would, at the very least, prevent any opponents from producing a direct male heir. The lack of an heir could mean political instability and was a factor in powerful men throwing their support behind a contender for the throne or not. It was also the law that a castrated man could never sit on the throne. This is because the emperor was supposed to be the symbol of manhood, and having a castrated emperor would send the wrong message to rivals in the empire and foreign enemies. That did not mean that eunuchs could not attain positions of power and responsibility. Monks and priests taken or brought as slaves from Rus Vikings, for example, were relatively well-educated, and their inability to reproduce and perceived lack of sexual desire meant that these men were often made the teachers or tutors to imperial wives, mistresses, and children. Most of the time, this was a safe bet, but there were occasions in which eunuchs did carry on sexual relations with wives, daughters, sisters, etc. Sexual relations for Catholic monks and priests was permitted for much of early church history, and in all the branches of Eastern Orthodoxy to this day, marriage is permitted. One of the most famous eunuchs was Basil Lekapenos, who, as the illegitimate son of Emperor Romanos I Lekapenos, who reigned from 920 to 944, was castrated as a child to prevent him from producing another branch of the family and from sitting on the throne. Illegitimacy was frowned on throughout Europe until quite recently. Basil did, however, become the power behind the throne as what we call the Prime Minister of the Empire for the next three rulers after his father was overthrown. You don't hear or see the word Byzantine with a small b that much today, but it's still used to describe situations, mostly but not always political as Byzantine. Simply put, 
Byzantine history is so full of plots, assassinations, exile, torture, and revenge that something that is very tangled and hard to figure out is often referred to as Byzantine. The power struggle in the Kremlin is so Byzantine that it might take years or decades to truly understand. One of the most famous Byzantine emperors is Basil, or in Greek, Vasilios. Greek became the primary language of the empire not long after its founding and was considered the language of sophistication and learning even in the old Roman Empire. Basil is known to history as the Bulgar Slayer because of his wars against the then-powerful Bulgarian Tsars. Basil was the great-nephew of Basil Lycopenos and was the longest reigning emperor in Roman and Byzantine history. In 1014, Basil went to war with the Bulgars, the ancestors of today's Bulgarians, who occupied then as now a territory bordering the empire to the north on the Balkan Peninsula. From the 9th century to the time of Basil, the Bulgarian Empire was quite large and the Bulgarians a formidable foe and threat to the Byzantines. The two sides had fought each other for over six centuries. After he defeated the Bulgars at the Battle of Cladion, Basil's 45,000-man army dwarfed that of the Bulgarian Tsar Samuel and the result of the battle was predictable. 15,000 Bulgarians were taken prisoner by the Byzantine army. Of these 15,000 men, only an estimated 150 retained their sight after Basil got through with them. Basil ordered 150 groups of 100 men to be formed on a field before him. Men were bound individually or in small groups. One man from each group was separated from the others, and then Basil had 15,000 men blinded in the same day. The destruction of this army and the loss of morale when word got back to the Bulgarian capital marked the beginning of the rather rapid decline of the Bulgarian Empire. To this day, Basil is a hero to the Greeks, who see themselves in many ways as the heirs to the Byzantine Empire. Basil is hated in Bulgaria. It's easy to see why. There are Greeks and Greek Americans who have a decidedly unusual and historic last name, Ethnakithes. Perhaps their ancestors were torturers, or perhaps they were emperors, for the name literally means eunuch maker. We hope you did not cringe too much while watching our video today. If you would be so kind, please drop us a like and subscribe to our channel. The consequences of not doing so should be evident. Of course, we joke. Thank you for watching.